Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex. Today, we're going to talk about overheating. It is getting very warm outside, y'all, and I, for one, need to work on my car. I need to go ahead and refill the coolant in it to get the AC running back optimally, as I discovered today when I went out for a drive. So, if you, like me, have noticed how quickly we have seemingly gone from winter to summer, and I think part of that conception is due to social distancing guidelines, then it's important to also understand how to stay healthy in this heat. So today, we're going to talk about how the body regulates heat, some signs that you may be dangerously overheated, as well as how this particularly affects older adults and what to do about it if you are overheated due to exercise, your environment, or any of these factors in combination with age. So first up, let's learn about how our bodies regulate heat. So our bodies have kind of a complicated temperature regulating mechanism. You have to balance heat production with heat loss because we don't want to be too warm or too cold. And we also like computers, like phones and other mechanical devices. We can overheat and not be able to function properly just like we can be underheated and not function optimally. So our body has to do this balancing act to seamlessly and automatically control these levels of our temperature. And that is largely regulated by the hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is a small part of your brain that acts as the command center for a bunch of different body functions. And that includes the coordination of your autonomic nervous system. And that is where we are getting this temperature regulation from. So it works a lot like how a thermostat regulates the temperature inside a house. And the hypothalamus regulates your body temperature in response to internal and external stimuli. And then it makes adjustments to keep your body within 1 to 2 degrees of 98.6 degrees on average. So unlike a thermostat, A thermostat tends to just turn the heat or AC on or off until you get to the temperature that is ideal for you, the temperature that you have preset it to. But the hypothalamus is more complex than that, and so it has to regulate a very complex set of temperature control activities. So there's a lot that goes into how warm or cool your body is. Part of that is going to be balancing your body fluids and also your electrolytes, especially those salt concentrations. And it's going to also control the release of chemicals and hormones as they are related to temperature. And it's not just your hypothalamus doing this on its own. It has to cooperate with other parts of your body to help regulate your temperature. And these parts of your body include your skin, your sweat glands, blood vessels, All of these things act as vents and condensers and heat ducts in your body to promote proper heating and cooling. 
So you remember the outer layer of your skin is your epidermis. Your epidermis is showing. And then underneath that is your dermis and then the subcutaneous tissue. So that middle layer of your skin, the dermis, is where most of your body's water is stored. So when heat activates your sweat glands, those glands bring that water along with a lot of salt in the body to the surface of your skin in the form of sweat, which is why sweat tastes salty. So once it's on the surface of your skin, then the water evaporates. And when it evaporates, it cools the body and keeps your temperature in a healthy range. So if you're out and about doing whatever form of exercise, or perhaps you're moving as it is moving season in the middle of this summer heat, you may be sweating quite a bit. I often see a lot of people toweling off that sweat, but really it's not the presence of sweat on your body that is there to help cool you down. It's the evaporation thereof. So you actually will do yourself better in cooling down by leaving that sweat on your body and allowing it the opportunity to evaporate and thereby cool you down. Just like when a dog is panting, we're not going to tell it to just go ahead and close its mouth and breathe through its nose. It needs to go ahead and regulate its temperature. And similarly, we need to make sure we keep that sweat so that we can cool off appropriately as well and keep our temperatures in a healthy range. That doesn't mean you can't wear a sweatband, you guys, to keep the sweat out of your eyes, but we do recommend going ahead and letting that sweat evaporate. Now, related to your function of your blood vessels, they also react to introduction of outside organisms like bacteria and internal hormones and chemical changes by expanding and contracting just like they do in other circumstances. So this helps move your blood and heat closer to or farther away from the surface of your skin. And that helps you release or conserve warmth. So you may notice that when you are working out that you get really warm. And your skin may even feel warm to the touch if your friends touch it. Or if it is very cold out, you notice that your hands and your toes and your nose get colder. And that is because your body is trying to regulate that heat closer to the internal organs that you have and farther away from your skin so that you don't lose the heat and so that the necessary mechanisms to keep your body going, like your heart and your lungs and all of the super imperative portions, are getting enough oxygen and getting enough heat. So it's going to draw away from the extremities and from the surface of your body, which lends to us getting cold hands and feet and noses, and then you get a runny nose if you are anything like me. So when all the parts of your body's heat regulation mechanisms are operating correctly, your body temperature is going to stay about 98.6 degrees. But there are certain times when that body temperature can kind of go sideways on you. Those instances tend to be heat stroke, hot flashes, fever, and we're going to talk about some of those today. So for heat stroke in particular, on most days, your hypothalamus is reacting to increases in outdoor temperatures by sending messages to your blood vessels and saying, hey, you need to dilate, and then send warm blood, fluids, and salt to the skin so that you can evaporate and cool down this body. But if you are in the heat for a very long time or in really extreme temperatures like really bad heat, really strong humidity, then your evaporation process may fail. And if you are prolonged to heat in a long-term fashion, so you have prolonged heat exposure, then your body can sweat so much that it can completely deplete itself of fluids and salts and thereby leave nothing to sustain the evaporation process. When that process ends, your body temperature may vastly increase, 
and you may get a heat illness, including the most serious form of heat illness, which is heat stroke. So to know if it's heat stroke, you may have symptoms such as really red, hot, dry skin with a really speedy heartbeat. You may have a throbbing headache from essentially being dehydrated. Your body temperature may soar above 103 degrees Fahrenheit. You may have some dizziness, nausea, confusion, or even become unconscious. So it's important to get help for heat strokes because that's a life-threatening emergency. And if you have those symptoms, you need to cool down quickly while someone contacts someone in an emergent capacity. So uh, the EMS or EMTs, if you're at a festival, the festival personnel who are responsible for health conditions. And one of the most effective ways to cool down is to spray or douse your body with water and sit by a fan to help out that evaporation process. And that will decrease your temperature while you're waiting for medical personnel. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some ways you can prevent heat stroke, as well as some other issues that may result in temperature problems in the body, including hot flashes and fever. Stay tuned. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco, ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project that's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness are you looking to learn more about the latest trends from the fitness world Are you confused by all the different trends that are out there? The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place for you. The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place to come for people of all skill and interest levels. Join us as we explore the latest trends in the fitness world. Does that new exercise really work? Should I try yoga? Whatever your question, chances are good you'll find an answer on the GSMC Fitness Podcast. about how the body regulates heat and also introducing the concept of heat strokes and how that can impact your body. So we talked about the symptoms related to heat stroke and that you definitely need to seek out medical personnel if you are having a heat stroke. But now we're going to talk about also how to prevent it as well as some other issues related to temperature regulation in the body, including hot flashes and fevers. So heat stroke is very serious and it's most strongly 
propose that you really focus on prevention of this. And that's especially true for people who are 65 and older because they are higher risk for heat illnesses just because their regulating mechanisms become less effective with time. That's just something that typically happens to humans as we age. Now, on top of that, cardiovascular and neurological conditions can also increase a person's risk for heat stroke. So can medications that interfere with your body's ability to sweat properly, and that can include some antipsychotics and antispasmodics. So folks who have those conditions or take those types of medications need to pay special attention to the weather and the heat index, that combination of humidity and heat. If the temperature is rising, drink a lot of fluids and stay in a cool environment if at all possible. If you're worried about heat exposure or you're having problems because of the heat, contact your doctor. If it's a real crisis and you're already in heat stroke, you need to go to the emergency room and the doctors would rather see you come in sooner rather than later to maximize their potential to help you out. Now, this happens a lot in archaeological digs and we do something called prehydrating. So the couple days before you start going out for the dig, you drink a lot of water and also a lot of Gatorade just as much as you can get into your body. If you feel thirsty at any point, that means you're already dehydrated. So that is not good. So it's important that you keep drinking enough fluids. And you should also be peeing frequently. If you're drinking a lot, but you're not peeing frequently, you need to go ahead and up that fluid intake as well, because that means you're not getting enough fluids to go ahead and pee like you should be. So that's something that we measure that by in archaeological context and just anthropological context in general. How frequently are you peeing? Do you look a little peaked? Do you look overheated? Then you need to go sit down for a little bit. And we get very firm with folks about that because it is imperative that you don't get overheated in those contexts because similar to construction work and such, you're working out really hard and you are performing manual labor while at the same time you are in sometimes upwards of 115 degrees. So it's important to keep an eye on that and to drink water before you're thirsty. When I first moved to Texas, it was a record heat wave and it was 114 degrees the first time I went out to the forensic facility to perform some duties that we needed to do there. And that involved, you know, digging some holes and stuff. And while we were out there, my brand new boss told me to go ahead and drink some water. We'd only been out there for like 30 minutes. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm fine. Thank you. And she got really firm, but nice. She's a great person. But, and she was looking out for my health. But I, at the time, I was like, I don't know you. But she told me, go ahead and drink some water. She's like, just trust me, drink some water before we go any further. And I'm like, okay. And so I went to go ahead and do this just to make her happy. But as soon as that water touched my lips, I drained the whole bottle. I didn't even know that I was thirsty yet or that I was dehydrated until the water touched my lips. So it's kind of similar in principle in these extremely hot or humid environments that you go ahead and drink some water or some Gatorade just in case. Kind of like when you're on a road trip and your mom's like, you should get out and go pee. And you go, oh, no, I'm good. I don't have to go right now. And she goes, no, just go ahead and try if your mom's anything like my mom. So generally in those cases, the moms were right and also in this case, my boss was a thousand percent right and I was just very new to this climate and was not prepared for that. So living in different climates, if you move to a different area, it's really important to keep that in mind as well. So you can prehydrate and just continually make sure you're hydrating. I also feel like peeing and pumping gas are two of the largest time sucks in my life, but when it comes to your actual health and wellness, it is much better for you to go ahead and be peeing very frequently than to get a heat stroke. So now that we've covered heat strokes, 
let's talk about hot flashes. So individuals who have female hormones have a regular monthly cycle of those hormones fluctuating, just going up and down. And during menopause and the years leading up to it, that cycle of your hormones can get really erratic and extreme, and you can get huge fluctuations in estrogen levels. So those fluctuations in that hormone lead to a large-scale chain of events that can affect the function of your hypothalamus and can also trigger changes in your blood vessels and how they regulate your blood flow. So it can increase your blood flow. When those blood vessels constrict and expand rapidly, you get what is called a vasomotor spasm. So that's a blood vessel movement spasm. And those spasms are what really initiate that chain of events that lead to your skin getting flushed and feeling hot in what we call hot flashes. So to tell if you're having a hot flash, your rise in temperature in a hot flash should not really be severe. If it's a hot flash, then the blood rushing to those vessels nearest the skin might raise in temperature on your skin temperature by about five to seven degrees, but your core body temperature will typically not rise above that 98.6 degree average for normal temperature. So you can feel the outside of your body and then take your temperature and see if there's a discrepancy with the inside of your body. So your internal body temperature and your external body temperature. But it can still feel really extreme as a change to the person who is experiencing the hot flash. So that's one way to do a quick check on it and tell the difference between a hot flash and something like heat stroke, a heat illness. So hot flashes can also cause a lot more issues than just general discomfort. They can lead to excessive sweating. They can also interrupt your sleep patterns. And it's important to really see a doctor about hot flashes because not all of them are related to menopause. There's something that we strongly associate with menopause, but there are various different tests that the doctors may need to perform to have a full understanding of where your specific health is. So when you're getting hot flash treatment, a lot of folks tend to choose hormone replacement therapy or take antidepressant medication to ease hot flashes. But those do have side effects and you need to discuss them with a doctor. Treatments for hot flashes can end up being rather complex. That's why you want to find a doctor that you trust So you can have that partnership relationship in working on your treatment plan. Remember, everything is impermanent, you guys. You can go ahead and change doctors based on doctor availability, understandably, and also access to resources. I totally understand if you live in a small town area like where I grew up and there are not a ton of doctors around your area and you have to drive a lot further and it might not be feasible but if at all possible go ahead and find you a doctor that you trust work with a couple of different people even if it's just another doctor within the same building and that way you can create an individual treatment plan that you're comfortable with and that works for you while still meeting all of the goals that your doctor has for you as well It's also generally important to just make sure that they're able to run those full tests on you, even if you are around menopausal age, because there are other issues that can also cause these problems, like hypothyroidism. So if you have an underactive thyroid, it can also lead to you having some problems with your temperature regulation. We're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about fevers and signs that you may be dangerously overheated. Stay tuned. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. 
Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. associated with menopause, but menopause is not the sole cause of hot flashes. So it's important to see a doctor about them, even if you are about menopausal age and suspect that they are caused by menopause. They just need to rule out other problems that might be related to hypothyroidism and other types of medical issues. So now we're going to talk about fevers. If your body temperature rises to 99.6 degrees or higher, you technically have a fever. So remember, your body, your hypothalamus in particular, is working to keep your body within 1 to 2 degrees of 98.6 degrees on average. And if you get to 99.6 degrees or higher, technically that is a fever. So that's only 1 degree higher than what your body is supposed to be at. That means your poor hypothalamus is doing a lot of work all the time. If you're in the office and your coworkers keep it a little bit chilly, your hypothalamus is working to keep you warm. And if you go outside and get in your warm car, your hypothalamus is working to keep you cool. But sometimes you do get a fever. So how does a fever technically occur? Well, your hypothalamus responds to multiple different factors, including infectious organisms and injuries, by releasing fever-producing chemicals to help change your body temperature. So those chemicals result in your blood vessels narrowing and pulling heat to that innermost part of your body, and that is a fever. So fevers signal that you have some type of foreign pathogen in your body, and it also tells you that your body's immune system is working to fight off that invading pathogen. So as the body fights off the infection, your fever will naturally resolve itself, typically. However, 
Sometimes fevers can be a cause for concern. They're rarely dangerous or damaging, but in some cases, they still can be. So we're going to talk about those. If you have a fever over 102 or 103 degrees, especially if it lasts more than a day or two and it does not have an obvious cause, like it's not accompanied by cold or flu symptoms, then you should go ahead and be a little concerned about that and speak with a doctor. A fever is a cause for alarm when it is 105 degrees or higher, and that's when it's especially dangerous. You definitely need to seek medical attention at that point, because if you leave that type of fever untreated, it can lead to dehydration, dizziness, weakness, and confusion, which sounds a lot like heat stroke. So whether it is caused by external stimuli or internal foreign invaders, you can get really high temperatures that are cause for concern. And that can be a fever or heat stroke or other types of heat illness. So if you have those types of symptoms with a fever, that dehydration, dizziness, weakness, or confusion, see a doctor as soon as possible. They recommend reaching out to your primary care physician most of the time, but you also can go to a hospital, a walk-in clinic, and other types of same-day primary care appointments. If you are concerned about your fever, it's good to call in or stop by. Now we're going to talk about three signs that can tell you that you may be dangerously overheated. So we've already spoken about heat stroke, which is what happens when your body's core temperature is elevated to over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point your body may entirely stop sweating or may just reduce in the amount of sweat you're producing, and you may get confused or dizzy or have another type of altered mental status. However, that is not the only type of heat-related illness that you should be concerned about. You can also get heat cramps and heat exhaustion when your body can't cool itself, and that can be especially prevalent in hot summer months. So heat cramps are painful contractions, and you get them mostly in the calves, thighs, or shoulders, and they occur because your body is losing salt and water from exercise. Heat exhaustion, on the other hand, comes before heat stroke, and is brought on by a loss of water and electrolytes. So your body's going to start sweating excessively, and then your core body temperature is going to elevate to over 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, but still less than that 104 degrees Fahrenheit that denotes a heat stroke is occurring. So heat-related illnesses can be very serious, and in some instances they can actually lead to death. So it's important to be aware of these signs and symptoms. Having taught courses in the Texas summer heat, I am acquainted with these and make sure that my students go and drink plenty of fluids. So that is something that they take very seriously at my alma mater, especially in the anthropology department. And so that is something I wanted to bring up with you guys because it's more common than you think it is. We also designate someone to go around and remind everyone every 15 to 20 minutes to drink more water and Gatorade, and we supply Gatorade and water for these summer classes. They take it very seriously because they don't want anyone to pass out or become harmed in any way. We also go ahead and set up tents over top of anything we are excavating just to make sure that we have some shade if and when at all possible. And if someone has been working in the sun, the unshaded area, for too long, we will go ahead and swap out. And not really for too long. Rather, that 15 to 20 minutes, we will swap out and make sure that everyone is okay. In extreme situations, we also take a physical break underneath the tents where we are keeping our camping chairs and stuff every 20 minutes or so just to be on the safe side because we've still seen people overheat. So when you're looking for these signs and symptoms in yourself and in others, you want to make sure 
that you're paying attention to whether you get heat cramps. So those are the painful contractions typically in your extremities. Symptoms of heat exhaustion can often include nausea, a headache, fatigue and or weakness, irritability, dizziness, confusion, thirst, or even signs of dehydration like your urine becoming dark. So when you are peeing in these situations, make sure that not only you're peeing frequently, but that your urine is a good color. You want it to be a nice light color to make sure that your body is truly getting enough water. For heat stroke, you may see all the symptoms of heat exhaustion, like the headache, confusion, and weakness, plus an altered mental status and that external and internal body temperature being 104 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. So if you have any of those symptoms, it's important to call 911 right away so that you can get prompt medical attention. For treating heat cramps and heat exhaustion, medical personnel will typically remove you from the heat, give you fluids with electrolytes, and cool your body by spraying it with water and using a fan. We've had to do that a lot when I used to do face and body painting for a living to help pay for college, and we would work festivals, so sometimes 12, 15 hours per day. And we were used to that environment and drank plenty of water and everything as we went along, made sure we had food so we didn't feel faint or weak. But a lot of folks were just not prepared for it. You know, you're you're having fun at the festival. You're walking around and drinking soda or, you know, these really sweet treats. You're getting funnel cakes and everything and not necessarily thinking about how much water you're getting. No one goes to a festival to drink water, right? You're there for all of the weird festival treats like deep fried Oreos that you can't normally get because it's a treat, you guys, right? However, it's really important whether you're at the theme park or the local pickle festival that you are getting enough water and electrolytes at the time. We had a couple of people faint almost in our tent or just become generally dizzy and non-responsive and it got to the point where we would always keep the spray bottles with us as well as wet wipes that we would keep in the cooler with our drinks and everything so that if somebody passed out in the tent you could go ahead and wipe them down while the other person ran to get the emergency personnel who were dedicated to the festival. It happens a lot more than you would think. Adults, children, People of all ages, I've seen it happen in real life. So I know right now most of us are not able to go out and do those things. Lots of festivals have been canceled due to social distancing guidelines, as they should be as we're dealing with this pandemic. But just something to keep in mind in the future, no matter what reason you're outside, if you are in the heat for an extended period of time, make sure that you're, you're getting some water as well as those sweet treats. For treating heat stroke, the medical personnel will typically remove a person from the heat and start applying cooling measures like cold water immersion. They might apply ice packs to the groin or administer IV fluids and check your breathing and circulation. These are preventable illnesses, though, by and large. So during the heat of the summer, try to stay out of the sun, keep hydrated, keep an eye on your urine color, and also avoid constrictive clothing and alcoholic beverages if possible. So if you expect someone to be experiencing heat exhaustion or stroke, then your primary response should be to go ahead and get them cooled off promptly and call 911. Folks who have experienced symptoms of heat exhaustion and or heat stroke should always be evaluated by medical personnel just to establish those proper treatment needs and determine whether it is safe for them to return to normal activities. We're going to go on another break, and when we come back, we are going to talk about some health effects and first aid.
The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. talking about fever as well as signs and symptoms of being dangerously overheated. Now we're going to talk about some health effects and first aid. So in addition to these other types of heat-related illness, like heat stroke, heat exhaustion, and heat cramps, you can be exposed to heat stress. Heat stress is your net overall heat load, to which someone may be exposed from the combined contributions of your metabolic heat, so the natural processes of your body, environmental factors like the external temperature, humidity, air movement, radiant heat, and clothing requirements. So your metabolic heat is produced in your body through chemical processes, exercise, hormonal activity, digestion, and so on. Heat can come from many sources as well. In certain types of jobs, like in steel mills, in bakeries, places that smelt different types of metals, glass factories, furnaces, they use a lot of extremely hot or even molten material, and that can be a main source of heat. So even some folks who work indoors, like the glass blowers I have seen here in Texas, it's very, very hot in that environment. In outdoor occupations like anthropology and construction, road repair, agriculture, summer sunshine is generally the main source of heat. And in places like laundries, restaurants, kitchens, and canneries, you can get high humidity in addition to the heat. So in all of those instances, whether it is something that you're making that is causing all of this heat, or the process by which things are being made, or even just being exposed to the sunshine, these different work environments can overwhelm your body's ability to deal with heat. So a lot of folks are most comfortable when the relative humidity changes from 35 to 60%. And when that humidity gets higher than that, then people tend to feel uncomfortable. So those situations don't really cause harm so long as your body can adjust to the additional heat. But very hot environments can overwhelm your body's coping mechanism and lead to a variety of of serious and potentially fatal conditions. So how does your body react to hot environments? Well, a change of your body temperature of more than about one degree or so typically occurs only when you're ill or when the environmental conditions are greater than what your body's able to cope with. As that environment warms up, your body also tends to warm up. Just like in the wintertime, as it cools down, your body feels like it's cooling down and you shiver. So your body's internal thermostat is going to help give you a constant inner body temperature by pumping more blood to the skin to increase that sweat production. And as it works that way, the rate of heat loss is balancing the heat burden. But if you are in a very hot environment or you're exposed to it for a long time, then your rate of heat gain is going to be more than your rate of heat loss. And so you're not able to shed as much heat as you are gaining at that same time. And so that it's out of balance and your body temperature rises. 
And that rise in your body temperature is what is resulting in heat illness. So, how does your body regulate heat gain and heat loss? Well, it's those biochemical processes in your body that keep us alive and they give you the energy we use in physical activity. So your body can exchange heat with the surroundings via radiation, convection, and evaporation of sweat. So what are radiation, convection, and evaporation specifically? Well, first up, radiation is the process of your body gaining heat from objects that are hot in your surroundings, like hot metal, furnaces, or steam pipes, and it loses heat to cold objects like chilled metal surfaces without contact with them. So no radiant heat gain or loss occurs when the temperature of the surrounding objects is the same as the skin temperature. So if you've ever been outside at the pool or cooking out on a hot sunny day and you go inside real quick to go to the bathroom or wash your hands and, you know, you notice the faucet's really cold or you accidentally back up into the fridge and you're like, eep, it's very cold, then that is when your body is warmer than the surroundings and that is that radiant heat loss. Although, in that environment, you would not even have to touch those items in order to radiate that heat. So think about a radiator that you see in homes or in hotel rooms. It's just radiating off of the radiator. That's all it is. It's just the heat coming off of it into the surrounding area without you having to touch it. Whereas convection is the process of your body exchanging heat with the surrounding air. So your body gets heat from hot air and loses heat to cold air when it comes in contact with the skin. So the convective heat exchange increases with increasing air speed, like wind or if you have forced air or air conditioners in your home, and increased differences between your air and skin temperature. So if you're outside in the heat and it's like 120 degrees and then you go inside to pee or to wash your hands and you're like, whoa, that is really cold and crisp. And even though it's only like 72 degrees in your house, well, that's a huge heat disparity between inside and outside. So that is that convection heat where you're exchanging that body heat with the surrounding air. So evaporation of sweat, on the other hand, is what's cooling your body, and it occurs more quickly, and it's more cooling if you have high wind speeds and low relative humidity. So in humid environments, because the air is holding so much moisture, it's a lot harder for it to evaporate, for your sweat to evaporate, that is. And remember that the evaporation is really what's cooling you, not just the sweat on your body. So if you're in high humidity, you can still have big problems even if you are actually still sweating. Being exposed to higher wind speeds will make the cooling effect more noticeable, as will that low relative humidity. If you're in a hot and humid workplace, the cooling of your body due to sweat evaporation is just overpowered by how much moisture is already in the air. If you're in a hot and dry workplace, then that cooling due to sweat evaporation can be limited by the amount of sweat produced by your body. So your body, in addition to this, also exchanges small amounts of heat by conduction and by breathing. So in conduction, your body gains or loses heat when it comes into direct contact with hot or cold objects. Like if you back up and touch that metal table while you're very warm because you've come in to pee. Again, I keep using that example, but that is what is most familiar to me from being outside a lot. I love cooking out, you guys, and that is when I go in, is when I need to pee or wash my hands if I've been touching meat on the grill and such. So if you touch that really cold surface, that is conduction because you're directly coming into contact with another object. And breathing exchanges heat because your respiratory system warms your inhaled air. So remember when we talked about lung health and respiratory health in general, 
we talked about how our nose and our mouth, as we start breathing in the air, warm it and moisten it to help our bodies be able to process it best. So, when you inhale, you're warming that inhaled air. And when you exhale, that warmed air also carries away some of your body's heat. That's why you're able to see your breath in the wintertime because it is so much cooler outside than it is inside of your body where that air is. But that amount of heat that's exchanged through conduction and breathing is normally really small, and it's typically small enough to be ignored in evaluating the heat load that's on your body. All right, we're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the dangers of overheating in adults and also heat-related relief. Stay tuned. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. aid in hot environments. Now we're going to talk about how seniors are more in danger of overheating the older we get. So hot temperature can have a really strong effect on senior health because our aging bodies have a harder time regulating the internal body temperature. Too much heat can be dangerous at any age, but as we get older, our body has an increasingly difficult time in dealing with extreme heat, and that can put us at risk of overheating and heat stroke. So we can reduce this risk by taking a couple of steps to protect our health and to prevent this type of heat-related illness when the weather is hot. So... Our brain tends to send special signals to our body when we begin to overheat. And those signals then prompt our body to release hormones that result in us sweating. And sweating is our AC system. It cools us down at the skin surface, and it also cools us down internally as our overall body temperature decreases. But sometimes it gets too hot out for that cooling mechanism to work, and it gets less efficient the older we get. So there are a number of factors that can increase your risk of overheating as you get older, and they can include being overweight or underweight, certain medications like heart and blood pressure medications, sedatives, tranquilizers, salt-restricted diets for high blood pressure, decreases in blood circulation, sweat glands that have become inefficient over time, weakness or fever due to age-related illnesses like heart, kidney, or lung diseases, as well as lifestyle factors like living in a hot home or overdressing or even a lack of transportation. So it's important to recognize symptoms of when you're overheating as soon as possible. And those heat-related illnesses can range from those muscle cramps we discussed earlier to swelling, dizziness, and heat exhaustion. The most severe outcome is still heat stroke for seniors, and that is potentially life-threatening. So some symptoms of overheating for seniors may specifically include sudden dizziness, thirst, headaches, nausea, muscle spasm, 
cramps in your abdomen, arms, or legs, as well as cold, clammy skin, lack of coordination, fatigue, or even swelling in your ankles. So if you or someone you're with has any of those signs or symptoms, you may need to reach out to medical personnel. If it gets to the point where their body temperature is over 104 degrees, or they are acting confused, have changes in behavior, like they are suddenly becoming rather irritable, or they're fainting or feeling like they're going to faint, start staggering, have trouble holding their balance, have flushed skin, stop sweating even though it's hot out, if they go into a coma, or if they have dry skin, a strong rapid pulse, or a slow weak pulse. It can go in either direction. So in those cases, you should seek out medical attention immediately, as those folks may be experiencing heat stroke. There are a few ways that you can try to prevent becoming overheated to begin with. And that starts with listening to the weather forecast. So you're going to pay close attention to your local weather reports, especially when we're in these really hot summer months. That way we'll know when it's too hot to go outside. Then you want to stay in to stay cool. So when the weather is hot and humid, when air pollution is also very high, you want to be in a cool air-conditioned environment whenever possible. Also, try your best to keep your home cool. If your home does not have air conditioning or fans, keep it as cool as possible in other ways. And that may include opening your windows at night, opening windows across the room from each other so that you can create some cross ventilation or some better circulation of that airflow, or cover windows that are in direct sunlight Pull those curtains shut and close those blinds in the heat of the day. Now, a lot of these are going to depend on safety issues as well. So by all means, make sure that you are following safety recommendations in your area. You also want to dress appropriately. So on warm days, wear cool, light colored clothes, especially those that are made of natural fabrics like cotton or linen those really breathable fabrics. You also want to avoid exercising in the heat. So if it's too hot out, go ahead and exercise indoors on those hot days. And if you really want to exercise outdoors, wait until the weather cools down. Either go early in the morning or closer to the evening and don't work out in the heat of the day. You can also drink plenty of fluids. So increase your water intake your fruit juices, although make sure that fruit and vegetable juices are that 100% juice and that you are getting them with fiber as well so that you are not getting too much of, you know, excess sugar in your diet because that can be more taxing on your other organs. You also make, want to make sure that you're drinking other hydrating liquids like Gatorade and such on those hot days, those sports drinks. So avoid caffeine and alcohol whenever possible in these situations because they act like diuretics and they cause your body to lose fluid. So you need to limit those beverages, especially when the weather is warm. I know a lot of folks feel that summertime is synonymous with beer and tubing, especially if you live in the south but it's important that you also take some water with you and or some Gatorade if you are going to be imbibing to make sure that you are not overheating. Now, warmth can be very nice, especially if you have aches and pains in your joints, but you also have to protect yourself against those dangers of hot weather. So when it comes to hot weather, too much of a good thing, can still be a health hazard, and it's important to keep that in mind, especially as we get older. So now that we have covered senior health in that way, I want to talk a little bit about some exercise-related heat exhaustion. It can go ahead and affect you in the form of heat cramps, heat exhaustion, or heat stroke. 
that we're going to particularly talk about heat exhaustion by hard exercise or work in a hot environment. So your brain usually keeps your body temperature within a degree or two of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius for those of you who prefer Celsius. And that temperature control is very important because a lot of processes in your brain work only within that ideal range. So your body has a few ways to lower your temperature when it gets too high, as we discussed earlier, like sweating. And heat exhaustion can result if we are not able to get rid of as much heat as we are gaining. But exercise-related heat exhaustion in particular happens when you can't get rid of the extra heat that your body is making during exercise, and your temperature is rising more than what is healthy. So something like not drinking enough fluids during exercise can also cause dehydration. And so that overheating and the lack of fluids can combine and result in you collapsing. Exercising outdoors on a hot day can be particularly problematic, especially in high humidity, because your sweat is not going to be able to evaporate so you can cool yourself. And that's one of the most important ways that your body gets rid of extra heat. So you can do a couple of different things to make it harder for your body to get rid of extra heat, and that can include having an infection, being dehydrated, being in poor physical shape, using alcohol before exercising. Remember, your metabolism is going to be up and running more after you exercise anyway, so maybe save those shower beers until after your exercise. Make sure you're fully hydrated before, that you're pre-hydrated, that you hydrate during, and that you're also well hydrated after. But your body will not only appreciate you more for waiting until afterwards to use alcohol so that you are not going to be overheating, but also you will be metabolizing it more efficiently at that point. So do keep that in mind and also drink plenty of water along with any alcohol you are ingesting. Not being used to a hot environment can also make it harder for your body to get rid of extra heat, as well as taking certain medications like stimulants, antihistamines, and medicines that are prescribed for epilepsy. Having other medical conditions like sickle cell disease or conditions that decrease sweat or having a chronic illness can also be a problem. In addition to adults over the age of 65 being at a higher risk, so are younger children because their bodies also can't cool down as easily as that of older children and younger adults. Folks who are also at an increased risk of heat exhaustion include women, people of Caucasian background, and folks who grew up in more temperate climates. We're going to go on another break, and when we come back, we are going to talk about heat relief. Stay tuned. TSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. as well as how older folks are also more at risk for heat-related illnesses. So, now we're going to talk about some ways that you can get some heat relief. Now that we know what the warning signs are and what these heat-related illnesses look like, we can really explore how to deal with them. So, 
If you are getting heat exhaustion, it does need to be treated or it may progress to heat stroke. So you need to seek medical attention immediately if those symptoms are severe or if the person who has heat exhaustion and or heat stroke has heart problems or high blood pressure. Otherwise, go ahead and help the person to cool off and seek medical attention if the symptoms worsen or last longer than one hour for heat exhaustion. If you're already in heat stroke, you need to seek medical attention. Now, those cooling measures that you may take in the meantime may be effective if they are associated with rest, drinking cool, non-alcoholic beverages. Remember in our episode about hangovers and alcohol, that alcohol can lead to dehydration and it's a diuretic. So you want to make sure that we're getting as much fluids into our bodies that our bodies will retain as possible. So water and other types of beverages like sports drinks that have electrolytes in them. You also want to have a cool shower or a bath or even a sponge bath. So that's why we would wipe people down with those essentially refrigerated baby wipes in the tent. It's very similar to a sponge bath in that manner, and we would spray them with the water bottles that we have. You can also make sure that you're in an air-conditioned environment. A lot of festivals do have air-conditioned tents, and it can be really important to get someone to that location. Although you may need the assistance of medical personnel, to safely move them there. You also want to try to make sure that they have lightweight clothing. So if they're wearing a jacket or something that can be taken off without compromising their modesty in any way, then go ahead and perhaps remove that for them if you know the person and have their consent. Remember, consent is imperative and it's very, very important in these situations. For heat stroke, you also want to be mindful about brain dysfunction. So the sweating mechanism fails at that point. So if this person is kind of listless and weak and has a headache or dizziness or they complained of that earlier or feeling nauseous, make sure you don't just chalk it up to festival food. They may well be having symptoms of heat illness. The warning signs of heat stroke can vary. But if you see those signs, like the throbbing headache, that red, hot, dry skin with no sweating, confusion, unconsciousness, dizziness, nausea, rapid, strong or weak pulse, or that temperature over 104 degrees measured orally, then you may be dealing with a life-threatening emergency. So call 911 when you start cooling the person down. Call them as you are cooling that person down. Get them to an air-conditioned area or a shady area and cool them rapidly using whatever method you can. If you guys are at your car, blast that AC on them. You can also place ice packs on areas like their wrist, neck, armpits, groin, and back. So all those places that you really work hard to cover up in the wintertime so that you don't lose heat. That's why we wear coats and scarves and things like that. We want to make sure we're not losing heat from our back and our neck and our armpits and our groin area. So go ahead and place those ice packs there. And then also immerse the person in cool water or apply cool water, like in a tub or shower from a garden hose or by sponging water onto them. Then fan them vigorously with whatever you may have around your hands, if you have a flyer, if you have a piece of fabric, whatever you have around you to help cool them down as rapidly as possible. If you're able to monitor their body temperature, continue doing so until the temperature drops to about 102 to 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Sometimes in these situations, a person's muscles might start uncontrollably twitching as the result of heat stroke. And if that happens, prevent self-injury, but don't place any objects in their mouth and do not give them fluids. 
If they're vomiting, you need to make sure that their airway stays clear by turning them onto their side into that recovery position. Heat cramps, on the other hand, are those muscle pains or spasm, usually in the arms, legs, or abdomen, and they can occur in association with sweating during strenuous activity. If you have heart problems or if you're on a low-sodium diet, make sure you get medical attention for those heat cramps. It can be more problematic for folks who have certain health conditions. If medical attention is not necessary, then go ahead and stop all activity and sit quietly in a cool place. Drink water or that sports beverage and don't return to strenuous activity for a few hours after those cramps subside because if you perform further acts of exertion, it could lead to heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Then seek medical attention for your heat cramps if they don't subside in an hour. You also want to watch out for sunburns. Sunburns damage your skin and should be avoided. So that discomfort with sunburns is typically pretty minor and the healing generally happens within about a week. But more severe sunburns may require medical attention. So it's important to consult a healthcare provider if your sunburn affects an infant younger than one year old, or if you have symptoms related to fever, fluid-filled blisters, or severe pain. And when you're treating a sunburn, make sure you're avoiding new sun exposure. You're also applying cold compresses or immersing that sunburned area in cool water. And apply moisturizing lotion to the affected areas. They recommend against using salves, butters, or ointments. Those are typically more oil-based, and you do not want that. You want the moisturizing lotion. And you don't want to break or otherwise pop those blisters. Let those heal on their own, or they may become infected. For heat rash, that is going to be a skin irritation caused by excessive sweating, during hot, humid weather. You can get it at any age, but it's most common in young kids. And that heat rash looks like a red cluster of pimples or small blisters. It's more likely to occur on your neck and upper chest, in your groin, under breasts, and in elbow creases. So the best treatment for heat rash is to provide a cooler, less humid environment, keep that affected area dry, And you can even dust certain types of powder over it to increase your comfort. So to stay cool, try to find air conditioning. You may go into a restaurant for that. If you have to be outdoors, try to limit your outdoor activity to morning and evening hours when it's very warm out. And rest often in the shade or air conditioning to give your body a chance to recover. Drink plenty of hydrating fluids. Drink a sports beverage to replace the salt and minerals that you lose in sweat. But if you're on a low salt diet, talk to your healthcare provider about what you need to do before drinking a sports beverage or taking those salt tablets, just to make sure that you're not compromising a different component of your health. Wear lightweight, light colored, loose fitting clothing and dress your munchkins, those infants and children, and loose cool clothing and shade their little heads and faces with hats or an umbrella or some type of covering if they are in the stroller. And then also wear sunblock. They recommend SPF 15 or higher, and the most effective products tend to say broad spectrum or UVA slash UVB protection on the labels. You want to put that on about 30 minutes prior to going out and reapply it according to the packaging directions. Don't leave kids or pets in cars. That can heat up very quickly. I've seen that happen in Texas where I've tried to just stay in the car when someone was running into the store real quick and coming back out. And within minutes, it was a huge increase in the temperature of that car with it turned off. And I was already sweating and had to go ahead and crank that car back on. Different climate zones are going to be more difficult in that 
situation. So just make sure that you're prepared to bring the munchkins or the little fur friends into the stores that you're going into if you are going to have them with you and stop at the store. You also want to take showers or baths or go swimming. Again, don't threaten me with a good time. Y'all know I love the water, so go ahead and treat yourself to a nice cool bath or shower or go swimming this summer when we're able to in safe, socially distant manners. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that you please subscribe to the show, and writing a nice review always really helps us. Also, if you could please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'd appreciate it. Thank you kindly, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Health and Wellness Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.